All right, guys, we're back. It is late March, early April by the time this flies, and we have a special guest here tonight. First of all, we have our co-host, Mr. Brian Hallbly. Brian, how's it going tonight, bud? Flying with the Eagle tonight, buddy. Oh, Doing yeah? well. Little Eagle Rare, ready to record some good podcast uh, material with Clint here. Heck yeah. And then we have Mr. Clint McCoy from Illinois. How you doing, Clint? I'm good, man. I'm glad to be partnering with this with you guys. You guys are. Just, I stopped. Just, I met you there at uh, just by happenstance up there. They're walking the ATA, and it's like, dude, we should talk sometime. Okay, bingo. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. Heck yeah! I I saw you walking behind me. I'm like, I gotta go hold the door for this guy. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna flag him down here and grab him. And uh, it's it's a great it's a great show for for that purpose. So the main reason I like going to that show is for networking and um, oh, that's great. And yeah, run into guys like you and and Brian and the likes. And uh, happy to have you on. So what's going on in Illinois tonight? What you up to? How'd your basketball team do? I haven't caught up. Uh, you're doing that on purpose. <laughs> you're you're doing that on purpose already. Well, um, Michigan's <laughs> dead too. So the whole Big Ten is dead. Uh, I've got my I've got my Illini gear on tonight. I saw it. I uh, I didn't do that on purpose. I probably should have thought that wardrobe over a little bit better. Yeah, they died, man. All these Big Tens that we follow all year long, man, they just get to beating and banging on each other. It seems like, and then when you get to the dance, they, you know, they run their wheels off. It's like grain trucks fighting Ferraris. You know, it's over with. Yeah, I hate to see them go, but. Yeah, in Illinois tonight, it's um, cold, windy, and like winter-like. Southeastern Illinois is where we're at, and uh, had a front move through. You know, we're trying to scout for a youth turkey right now, and boy, it's been tough getting on these birds. We're still in winter flocks. It's been pretty cold. It's going to get cold tonight, and spitting rain, kind of muddy out, kind of gross for almost April. Well, yeah, it's it's not much different up here. Um, we got dumped on with a bunch of rain yesterday windier than all get out today uh like real windy so maybe it'll dry some fields out i don't know um just waiting for that corner to turn got some trees need to get in the ground got some acorns need to get in the ground got some apple trees need to go prune that sort of thing so you know it's it's that time and uh i'm glad to be sitting here talking habitat with you two so let's get this thing rolling um Let's hear about who you are, where you're from, your background. You kind of covered where you're from, you know, how you got into habitat work and uh, deer hunting and and the whole likes. Oh, yeah. So uh, I'm from southeastern Illinois, a little town called Palestine. We just grew up here in Crawford County on a family dairy farm. So I always had kind of an animal background. Um, And I don't know how I got into hunting. That's a good question. Like, as a dairy farmer, my folks, you know, none of my no one took time for leisure uh, you know, in dairy farming. And uh, I picked it up from an uncle of mine, and, you know, but I then I was a kid just using the pump shotgun. And I'm like, how can I have more days afield than just seven a year? Bow hunting. And that's how it went. And, you know, just uh, kind of do it yourself kind of guy, really. I don't own a bunch of ground. We got a small family farm here and do a lot of knock and talks, a little bit of public, just kind of do it yourself guy i'm a veterinarian by trade for a living every day which is kind of a weird like i I see the irony in between the two i'm a walking contradiction always have been i suppose but um uh, yeah you spend all week patching them up and we can trying to take one down you know it's just kind of what we do that's kind of what we do I don't I don't think it's too ironic. I don't think it's too contradictory. I mean, we all we all care for the animals, right? I think yeah. I I I, I have no problem with it. Yeah, you'd be surprised. Really? Yeah, yeah, sometimes. Um you definitely get way more positive vibes than the negative by a tenfold on that note, but yeah, you you'd be surprised sometimes. Yeah, especially coming from people in the veterinary industry, believe it or not. That's it's not fun, but you just, dude, it's legal. Um, and oh, it helps contribute to habitat with every dollar I spend. Uh, you know, if we're helping them, you know, I'm going to keep doing it. Hell with them. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. 
So what's your what's your dairy farm like? What kind of ground is it? Is it a lot of a lot of ag? Do you have any topography? What's the soil oh, like? Yeah. Anything so like that? Around home here, it's prairie. Uh, it but it gently rolls. And it's not like the deep rolls that you'll see out in Iowa uh, in the ag ground out there. It's real gentle flowing. A lot of, there are some places a pancake flat, and then there are other places it has a little bit of topo, but very minimal. You have to uh, you know pick and choose your hills wisely around here. You don't have a lot to hide behind. Um, close to the Wabash River is where we're at. We have a lot of mixed hardwood timber, um, a lot of small wood lots too. We don't have anything bigger than I think maybe the biggest woodlot I hunt is probably uh, 80 acres tops. Um, other than public, public of course has got quite a bit more up on it, but uh, um, a lot of broken timbers, little bitty tiny woodlots, mostly hardwood. It's all mixed ag, you know, corn, soybeans. On the dairy farm here, we raise um, quite a bit of alfalfa, and we're like the only alfalfa around ever. And uh, you know, there's a couple other people that raise it. Like 10 miles away, but that's been a plus, as you can imagine. But oh, yeah, um, but uh, yeah, is that, so is that straight alfalfa you're running? Yeah, excellent. But it's ag stuff, you know, it's leaf hopper resistant and roundup ready, and they you know get squirted, and it, it you know makes for good cattle crop. And it's it's uh, nutritionally, I think, pretty similar to white tail, more white tail specific blends, but. You see deer out in it all summer. They don't seem to mind. Absolutely. So compared to back when you were younger, has the property changed? Has the area changed in terms of habitat or um, you know farming? What what's you know, prairie? I like I like hearing that. Uh, tell me about kind of then and now. Um. When I was a kid, no joke, not to tangent that section of my life real quick, but like the one of the biggest deer experiences of my life that really like went, okay, I have to deer hunt now. Um, a friend of mine, Dan Ramsey and me, we had two junkie beagle dogs when we were little big kids, shooting four ten shotguns, pushing them up a big old wide fence row that had some cedars in it, right? And on, on a either side of the fence rows, this big ag field. And well, our dogs start raising hell in there and it's coming my way. I'm thinking a rabbit's gonna bust out of here. I'm gonna crack them. But instead this giant, massive, like, I see just crystallizing your mind how big he is. Big bodied, like ghost white horns. He comes flying by me at like, literally just a few feet away from me. We were so close. And that dog hot on his heels, on his heels and it, it, it it made me go, uh, why am I chasing rabbits when, <laughs> when seriously? And it was the click. And so the, the one of the, where I'm segueing into that, all these fence rows you're just talking about that buck busting out of, they're gone. Everybody's got big planning equipment now, um, you know, 30 footers or little bitty ones anymore. Uh, so Everybody's got big, wide ag ground. Everybody wants to farm um, in larger swaths, and a lot of these fence rows are becoming broken down. We don't have near the small game that we did. Uh, we don't have definitely, definitely don't have um, the uh, the ever, type of evergreen like uh, cedars that we used to have. Um, we certainly don't have as much cover in general um, in the woodlots around home. In the last 20 years, one of the biggest things that's changed around here is logging practice. Um, in the late 80s, everybody went, the mature stands of timber in the late 80s when interest prices really got high for ground, uh, maybe mid to late 80s, um, where farmers were paying, they wanted to cash some of that um, you know, natural resource in and they logged the shit out of everything. And so in the early to mid 90s when I, started deer hunting boy everything was thick as hell it was literally there there was some really nasty stuff around uh, you know 25 years later and now a lot of that stuff looks like a city park and or has a shit ton of invasives growing in it now um you know that bush honeysuckle or autumn olive or green briar and so that's the shift that i've seen in my lifetime over the years and it's not 
anyone's fault or anything. I, I didn't mean to like throw farmers under the bus and say, oh, they're killing us all. Sure. That's not what I mean. Our forest management around here hasn't caught up with ag uh, management, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah, well, it just shows kind of where the priority is in your neck of the woods, right? I mean, yeah. and same with Southern Michigan, it's farming. Um, and unless you got foresters and good programs for TSI and this and that pushing, I mean, high grade and go or cut the timber and go. And I mean, we see it all the time. I mean, it, it happens all the time. Um, you know, we're going to be cutting on a guy's place this weekend. And one of the main things I want to watch out for after we cut is invasives coming back and taking over, you know, instead of natives. So. Um, but many people don't even, and I didn't know what that even meant a few years back. So I get it. Yeah. But it's cool though. Now that you guys think that people are starting to get the click, like, Hey, like I know a lot of farmers that don't set foot in their woods anymore. Like ever, hardly, but now they know what invasives are and they're starting to take some, uh, some note to, to that stuff. I think that's cool. You're just getting the general word out, man. Yeah. So, Clint, there's been a lot of discussion about the uh, rise and fall of the Illinois deer herd. Do you think that that had something to do with it, what you're talking about, some of the old habitat getting too old? That's a good, that's a good question, Brian. I think it's multifactorial. Um, I absolutely think it's uh, a lot of mass production habitat is pulled from maturity. That may have something to do with it. But if you look at it in the contrast, the more sunlight getting into those pieces of timber creates more food in general. So I'm not certain it's a timber management thing, but if you think about how combines used to be in the late 80s, mid 80s, um, versus the efficiencies that we have now, um, I think if we look at broken farm country on a nutritional standpoint, a lot of our nutrition um, in those fields is no longer there for the herd that it used to be. As a kid, I used to see herds, I mean herds of deer, 50, 60, 70, you'd see them all over the place in these cornfields. As time has gone on and implements have gotten more and more efficient, it leaves less waste grain. And couple that with fall tillage being a common uh, practice, there's very little food left available for the whitetail that he doesn't have to work for, dig for, expend energy for. Um, so I think maybe that has, it all kind of ties together. Lack of cover is another one. Um, if these deer don't have a proper cover, uh, that's killing us here too. So it's, it's, it, all, it all mishmashes together, I think, Brian, to answer your question. It's not just a one thing. It's an amalgam of several. Yeah, so uh, you, it's an interesting point you bring up, and, and we talk about that a lot, how efficient the uh, farm equipment has become. You know, back in the day, 80s and 90s, like you're talking about, there might have been some more brushy hedgerows and, and things like that. Now they're able to run the corn and beans right up to the cover and timber and whatever else is around them. They don't have to leave much that they can harvest. Yeah, and to that, to that point, uh, you, we talked about that buck busting out of uh, the little cedar thicket, you know, thermal cover. We are sorely lacking thermal cover where we live. Now, I don't, we don't get a lot of cold um, like you guys do up there. Our deer would die in about a week there before you guys are at, man. Really? Oh, shit. These are Southern deer, like they're Southern Illinois. Everybody likes to think you're from the South. Well, you're kind of in between. One week it'll be minus 17 and the next week it'll be 60. And literally that happened in the last month. But our deer, I feel like um, when they go through a, like a two week period of like super cold sub-zero weather without adequate thermal cover in, in proper areas close to food sources, where they don't have to travel and spend a lot of energy to feed. I think that has to do with it too. Um, there's very minimal cedar type trees and windbreaks for these guys, unless they're in big thick CRP and you'll 
you know, we can talk thermal cover all day long, but I, I think it's a, I think it's a mixture of a lot of different factors, Brian. Okay. Well, that makes sense. And, and we're seeing that in a, in a lot of places around the country for sure. I mean, that's one of the rewarding things that Jared and I get to go around and do our land plans and help some of these clients with their properties and try to bring it back to, to where it's gotten wrong and, and try to improve it the best that we can for sure. So being a vet, do you have uh, enough time to get your habitat work done or does that impact your, your projects? And tell us a little bit about that. Oh, no. Um, oh, we're as busy in my, I'm 17 years into the profession and I'm as busy now as I've ever been. Um, boy, we're seeing as a hospital, we're trying to see yeah, 60 or 70 patients a day plus eight or 10 surgical procedures. And yeah, it's a lot, um, but it's doable. Um, and I started to, <laughs> I started teaching an animal science and an animal nutrition class at the local community college that I went to school here when I was a kid um, on my day off. So not very much time, Brian. Like, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's not much time, uh, but there's a whole ton of things on my list. <laughs> <laughs> so do you work a, a steady schedule or rotate? How's that work? Uh, get... four, four and a half, four and a half a week. Yeah. Okay. Steady. So that allows you a couple of days every week, at least to get something yeah, done. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, my wife, Colleen knows Sunday is, uh, I'll probably not see you at all day. Uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> you know, it, it's a day for all day work. Well, let's get into those habitat projects. What do you have going on right now? Um, we just got done frost seeding a little bit of clover. Um, we only have, since we've got, on the farm here, since we've got so much alfalfa ground, we really don't have a lot of use for other legumes, you know, as a drawing attractant. Um, but we'll we'll plant little tiny, uh, what you'd call them, kill plots, maybe of, of clover. Um, and we've got one long, narrow one that's probably, oh man, he's probably 400 yards long by 50 yards wide. It's a big, long clover strip down along the edge of the timber, um, and it's on the proper like good wind side for it and everything. He just frost seeded that uh, not too long ago. And right now, as far as uh, habitat work, I'd like to be planting trees, but it's mud. Um, I have to wait for that for sure. Um, I have a little strip back here behind my house that we've been working on just planting. Uh, I like to be persimmon trees. I don't know why I just do. Um, but um, we just kind of taking care of that and did a burn around those little guys and just little tiny stuff. Um, I don't have, I don't own a bunch of ground, but one thing I have been working on on the family farm over several years is just whacking these stupid invasives out of it and make it, and we made a dent in it um, and, and we could still do more. Um, and some of the like super shade tolerant maples and stuff like that, just, you know, clobber them, but it's mostly by hand and it's only on days when you're like, you know what, today would be a great day to work outside and I don't have anything <laughs> in season and I have nothing else to do. I probably shouldn't. I really need to, focus. if I had more time, I'd focus a lot of my efforts there. So the clover plot that you have, is that in between the uh, timber and the pasture? Oh yeah. Right up against it. Okay. Yeah. Right up against the pasture ground. You planting any uh, screening or anything we like that? We should. Um, we thought about doing it, but we'd have to either move the fence or give up to get our drill in there and how it lays. I think we'd have to give up too much food space to screen it. It sure. really, as, as it lays, you really don't need much screen here as it lays because it's a top. And as long as you don't press the top, everybody typically beds in the bottoms below to the west. And um, it, screening would be a great idea just to give them more security from the east for sure. Because yeah. I'm a firm believer. I don't. I I definitely don't think deer like being in cow pastures. I mean, I've lived around here long enough and been on broken timber prairie habitat long enough and watched these deer and watched cows since I was a baby boy. They just don't like each other. I don't know yeah. why. Yeah. 
Um, I agree. But uh, that, uh, that, that with that crest and that pasture, what sucks sometimes is, and it sounds stupid, but if we could put a screen in there that the cattle wouldn't slam, sometimes when you're walking and through the pasture and access, and some of the cows are like, oh, hey, let's go follow him right to the blind <laughs> or to the tree stand. And so then you got all these damn cows up against the fence, right up against your food plot. And that's a total bust. So we need to screen the cows, not the deer. <laughs> like you literally have to plan your route. Like sometimes we'll just turn, like I've figured it out over the last couple of years. If you want to start, stop that, you just go out there and run the feed conveyor for about 10 minutes before you go. There you go. Before you go to the woods and it sucks everybody in. See, <laughs> the old decoy trick. Yeah. Oh, man, that's that's a new one. I haven't I haven't heard screening from the cows on 170 oh, something episodes. So that's that's awesome. <laughs> Seriously, they get right up your tailpipe and there's like 40 of yeah. them standing there. And there's deer can hear them. And I'm certain they can smell them. And they're probably laying in bed. It's like, yep, nope, not going over there tonight. Totally defeats the purpose. There was there was one time we were down in southern Ohio hunting, my buddy Jesse and I, and we parked in this in this cattle pasture and went down dropped off in the timber didn't see much came back and all the cows were standing around his truck like looking real guilty right like they just broke in and stole something type look on their face maybe that's kind of always how they look but and we're sitting there like this is weird we get up there they had licked all the michigan road salt off his truck every square inch (laughs) every every square inch had a tongue mark in it on the whole Dodge Ram, I'm I'm not kidding. It was uh, it I'm was dying. hilarious. You couldn't, make, you couldn't make that up. Like, we were like, "What is going on?" I'm like, "Dude, they licked your whole truck." <laughs> I've seen him do that before. Um, like, if, especially around here, if you some of the things we don't do as kids, like ice fishing, you know, when you're 16, 17, first, we don't get much ice to begin with, so it's really special when we do. Um, and I've seen them do the same thing, but not to that degree. Holy cow. <laughs> it sounds like, <laughs> sound like they give it a new paint job. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> it wasn't my truck, so it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's so good. Yeah. So, Clint, do you have um, many native persimmon trees around you, or, or is everything that you got that you've planted? You know, everything that I've got is stuff that I've, and I don't know my trees, but stuff that we've taken from the woods here. Um, We did get some, uh, we did get some plants through the NRC department. And I I couldn't tell you the life of me what uh, types of persimmons they were, but we planted a a a small grove of them just to take care of them. And I get tired of hunting them down in the woods, see, so when I want persimmon pudding or persimmon uh, cookies <laughs> like i want to go like yeah, let's go out back to the backyard and gather them up and bring them in that's sure. no joke why they're there <laughs> and for the deer and for the deer for the deer too but also for me and the invasives what kind of invasives are you battling over there mm. bush honeysuckle like you would not believe it. yeah it, it's it is a disaster and, and some of these woods that got logged in those like 80s and 90s, it didn't get done. I don't want to say it didn't get along the proper way, but boy, they got really clobbery with it and spread those uh, invasives all over the place, it seemed like. In one spot, it's like a hardwood top that's like sets up perfect. It's got a couple big draws in it. It's a nice big 40 acre square. Good big hardwood trees in it. Um, the invasives just were starting in on it when I no, I was maybe 20, 25. And so in the span of about 20-ish years, that invasive bush honeysuckle has choked out that whole woods. It is taken from, there is not an inch a man can walk through. It started on the south end of that timber and it, it there's not a square inch of it that doesn't have it in there. That whole place is ruined from it, I think. And you know, that's not, I, I hunt on permission on that piece. Um, but no joke, I won't set foot in there to look for a shed. Uh, I don't, I, if I do, I can't walk the, the next two days because I'm like, I have to crawl through it all. It's awful. 
So we fight that a ton here, Ryan. It's the worst. Now, are the are the deer bedding in that or using that at all just because it's cover? Or And then I have a follow-up to that um, I'll ask after. If you want my honest take, I, mean, I, I try to study a lot of buck beds or deer bedding in general. We all do. And my honest take on it is no. Um, it, as far as selecting for it, there are some that bed there locally and a lot of it is typically they have a terrain advantage um, or a site advantage, but I've, I've got so many thickets of that honeysuckle that's just a bush maze that was taken over. And, and autumn olive is also another thing you kind of deal with down here too, the same way, same, same type of shit, right? But yep. when I feel like when a piece of timber gets so chock full of it like that, A, the whitetail's visibility is way reduced. And B, he doesn't want to get all tangled up in a bunch of shit if he has to make some movements real quick when the bad guy's slipping up on him, right? So I feel like the only time I see those deer in that 40-acre chock full of bush honeysuckle is in the dead of winter when they're down un below in those low, val uh, low uh, spots on those south-facing slopes. That's about okay. the only time I ever see them in there. Now, you'll find some deer beds in there, and you'll have guys swear up and down that deer bed in, in um, bush honeysuckle, autumn olive, stuff like that. Yes, it may be in, it, they might. They may be individualized deer, but I just don't see it all that often. What do you guys think about that? Well, that's, that's a good question. And the reason I ask is probably you already know, like a lot of guys will say, hey, my woods is thick. You know, that's uh, it's great. It, it's already where it needs to be and it's it's all bh or autumn olive um deer bed in autumn olive on my 15 um were they bedding something better if there was something better there probably uh but i'm surrounded by it on three sides anyways so dealing with what i have there it, it works for me but uh it's hit or miss i mean we're when we recommend we don't yeah we recommend get rid of it and let, let a native come up which is my, my second question where you are killing this stuff and you have been successful eradicating it, what are you finding that comes up? Are you running a fire through there and, and what comes up? Um, Does anything come up? Like, tell me about what you're seeing in terms of a success there. I, I haven't had, had enough years of experience of okay. doing this yet. Um, but the one corner that I started in, I'm, I'm definitely seeing more shade and toler tolerant trees spring up real quick, um, even though you may not want them necessarily. They're a hell of a lot better than stuff like that. Um, sure. But, but I haven't done it for long enough uh, to give you an honest take on that yet. No, you're good. Appreciate the honest take. That's for sure. Um, now, we asked you, you know, a little bit about being a vet and and you you talk about you know you deal with people who wonder why you're a hunter and this and that how does how does being a vet affect your your habitat and or hunting strategy because you're a hell of a you're a hell of a deer hunter i'll tell you that um God, and lucky dude we all do yeah well <laughs> well i i just saying you some of the deer that i watch you chase are, are pretty freaking cool and uh so I'm wondering, you know, do you have this inside information? Like, do I need to go to veterinary school to become, you know, a hunter like like you are? Or I guess help me out here with <laughs> what advantages do you have? A buddy of mine who's a deer hunter and it was telling he was joking around with me a couple of years ago. He said, You ever watch that movie The Terminator where it shows what the Terminator can see and it's running all those data points? So I think that's you because you've got anatomy and physiology and all that other shit going on there. I'm like, that's a fair analogy, but it doesn't make me a better deer hunter. I mean, this deer hunting <laughs> thing is no kidding, dude. This deer hunting thing is luck. But but does it does it make you? I think you could make an argument. It, it might make you better. I, it doesn't. You don't have to be a veterinarian to learn about things like ruminant nutrition and um the breeding cycles and hormone structures of deer and you don't have to be a veterinarian to 
learn the anatomy and the physiology and, and things like that. It just takes self-study. And I've always been a deer self-studier ever since that damn deer run out in front of me in front of that beagle dog. Like we've all, I've always been a deer hunter first before I even picked up a weapon. Um, but then when the vet thing came along, it, it just makes a good mishmash, I guess. Uh, that's the best way I could. It's just spending time studying the critter, period. That's all sure. it is. That's all it is. Sure. And, and I appreciate your your humble response. I, I know uh, there's got to be something in there. So here's the way I see it. I think, I think and, and I've noticed this over the past few years, we get into this habitat nerds that Brian and I are. I, I think that we can see things when we walk through the woods that maybe I wouldn't have been able to see 10 years ago, right? So, and again, like you said, self-study, it's getting out there as experience. Um, from a vet point of view, is there anything like that that sticks out to you, or is it still just a woodsmanship, um, whitetail type learning curve? It's all the above, but I like you said there, Jared, I and, and you've probably done it too, Brian, over the last, like even the last five years, like I'll revisit a spot that I haven't been to in a long time, but I'm looking at it with a different eye. You know, it's like that second sight. It's the more you look at these scenarios, especially hunt scenarios and stand placements and so forth, the more you study it, the more you look at it, the better you get. Well, if you haven't been to a spot and you've been getting better, you go to that spot and you're like, shit, I was doing this all wrong. Or you, you, you can throw another take on how to utilize it for a hunt. You know what I mean? It, it, it definitely takes study. That's all it is. It's just work, dude. It ain't nothing else other than work. Yeah. It's just doing it. Yeah, you can add so many adjectives to it, I guess, whatever your favorite one is, but like people that think critically and, and somebody with a biology and science background or mind, if you want to say like you, I've noticed that with a lot of people that are very successful deer hunters and habitat managers, they just have a way of being able to think critically and do things different and react faster to take care of whatever their goals are. And so, you know, like I said, we can go on with as many adjectives as we want but you're exactly right yeah that's a good take brian critical thinking is a good one. i i feel like like and this isn't a, you know a humble brag or anything but like when I, as a veterinarian to make the link i have to think critically every single day like my patients literally can't verbalize to me hey doctor this is what is wrong with me and i've got to break them down and pull blood work and do diagnostics and have to put the puzzle together. And when you, it's no different in the deer woods. You got puzzles to put together around every tree. No kidding. No kidding. Yeah, I could have, I should have called you a couple of weeks back dealing with some dog, dog stuff. I had a bunch of questions. Should have put that together. I wasn't critically thinking. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Brian, that was a, a great comment though. I should have I should have asked you the question as well. That's it's like it's like almost uh like an engineer, right? They they see things a little bit differently too. Um more so than or, or maybe it's like the builder compared to the architect, right? You can you can design it up this way and then going out and putting it, you know, hammering a nail to wood could be a different different formula. Um okay. All right, I'm satisfied with that answer. I like to keep this moving to talk about the buck you're hunting this fall and kind of related into your shed hunting. I know you guys do some shed hunting down there. Um, I think I saw a picture of some Coke can size bases. Was that you? No secret information. <laughs> Remember that uh, Tom Hanks meme from or Tom Hanks, Tom Cruise from Top Gun clicks his pin. That's classified. <laughs> no, it's actually not classified. I'll tell you about it. I'll show it to you. Oh care. boy. Well, if you guys aren't watching the video version of this, you should be. <laughs> right, so let me give you a backstory here. This is a buck we call the Heartbreak Kid, HBK. I'm a closet professional wrestling fan. 
always have been. I'm a Hulkamaniac OG. Uh, we named him Heartbreak Kid, though, because he, he when we first started meeting up with him in the summer, first time you saw his photos on truck cam, it was like, whoa, holy shit here. This is a monster, and I don't know anything about him. Total noob to the place. Like, stop you in your tracks, heartbreak, right? So we start working on him. Where he was at in the summer this year was covered in corn, and my topography, I couldn't do anything with it to see his movements in and out of the timber. Just chalk, there's a corn jungle. And so we had to do a lot of our stuff on foot in the summer and with trail cameras, and we were pretty successful with getting a lot of photos of him. So he was, he was like number two on the list or so, like one of the ones we really wanted. And boy, and I started hunting him around the rut, and he was, we were just a step behind this deer. About every, he backdoored us twice, caught our wins twice, me and him both, two different stands, like. This total kick you in the ass. That's why he got the name HBK. Like, <laughs> um, but he was, you know, long and short of it, we picked these sheds up. We've been in lots, lots of winter scout for him. And where he's going to be at this year, beams as far as the eye can see. And with the topography that I've got, I've already got a couple stands hung for the summer where I can slip in underneath and get up on top and glass all night in those. I'm facing dead square west, so the summer sun's going to be really hot on you until it goes down, but you'll be able to see the, all that shaded bean line that they feed in and yep. you know, put the squeeze on him, hopefully. <laughs> but this way, it looks like, honest to God's story on these sheds, it sounds like bullshit, I'm making it up, but I'm not. Um, my mom lives a long, long ways from where this deer is at. Like we're talking unheard of distance. And she says, hey, I found a shed in my yard today. And she lives in the middle of nowhere where there's no trees, like prairie type stuff, right? This is the one she finds in her yard. And it's miles from where we got him. And wow. base. So he's got a big old fat split brow on there. He's Decent there, and a neighbor boy of mine found his other side. I don't know if you can see it or not. Found oh, his yeah. other side, and this is the heartbreak side. He's got these weird. He had another big flyer point here, like oh yeah, eye guard. He had another one there, but he's a really he, unique deer. And when he sits on his head, these shadows by themselves don't look like much in your hand, maybe. But when he sits on his head. He's way wide, dude. Like he's got like a 20, I don't know, 24 inch, 25 inch spread, but yes, sir. PK's on the list. And it's weird, like these sheds when we pick them up, it's just bullshit luck for one. Um, but for but it is, it's just stupid mm -hmm. luck. I didn't pound in his area looking for those sheds where he was feeding. My boy almost got a shot at him in January in the winter. And we've been pounding that area for weeks trying to find these sheds. And they're like, oh, several miles in the opposite direction and in territory that's literally like flat, wide open prairie. And we're like, what the hell do you do with this? Like the information, I mean, you know, like, yeah. what do you make of it? You know, it's weird. But he's, he's definitely public enemy number one. I really... I don't know why, but I got the itch for him bad, real, real bad. Oh, I can see why. <laughs> yeah, he's not. <laughs> I can see why, too. When they backdoor us like that and they get around me, that really just, man, that just drives me crazy when I've got one that I've been. You guys probably know it, too. You've been working on one and you whipped your ass. Oh, yeah. And it's just, you're so close to closing the deal and you just got the bad luck stick that day, like, yeah, those those ones really get under my skin. So what what did you learn from that when when he backdoored you or your boy? Because I know when I got I got backdoored or or straight up beat one morning this fall as well. Um, I learned something about it. Any what what comes to mind when you think about your setup or changing from for this year? Or what are your thoughts? absolutely 
what my setup's problem was when he hit us uh, that day we were, we were tag team hunting and we had neglected the doe bedding area position from his travel route. And so we kind of put ourselves on the down or the poor wind side of those transition trails, those bucks we use to go on the downwind side of those doe bedding areas. I should have been way further up higher so our thermals were would take away that scent up over the tops where these does are bedding. And I, I should have been on the hard downwind side of that doe bedding area and it killed it totally killed us. It, and, and it won't happen again. Oh man, that's tough to hear. I, and I always wonder about that when, when guys say, you know, I got a picture of him. I should have been in the stand that day. He was on the camera right by the stand. And you always wonder if, well, did he circle way down window that stand first, like he did for you? Well, that's, how we, that's how we know he backdoored us. Um, right. We got him on camera doing it even. Troy saw go. it, and I he pulled the cards later. He definitely did it on, on intentionally. Hmm. Yes. Yep. Yeah, and you wonder how many times it happens to you, like, and you don't even know about it, like. Right. Absolutely. It could be happening every day, and you wouldn't know. <laughs> Well, I kind of, yeah, exactly. And there's certain habitat things that we do, you know, to avoid some of that. Uh, but and or certain terrain features you can take advantage of to avoid things like that. But uh, kind of segueing to my next point here, what would be one of your most impactful hunting setups that you've created, like a like a big buck mouse trap that's bulletproof or that has worked well for you? Um, let's talk about that. Maybe a a success story where you know they weren't back doing you they weren't able to to get one on you and it's just it's a solid spot yeah so there's a it's a decoy spot and um it really wasn't a lot of habitat work but it is on the fringe of it there's this little point of thumb that sticks out of this timber and it's on the very high spot, this wide open vast prairie field. And there's these two great big walnut trees along the edge that are just, I mean, coated in vines when I first start thinking about this setup. Like it would take you days and, and it would, the trees were so big, they were really difficult to do anything like climbing wise with them or to be safe. And so I had to like, you know, go through with a handsaw and some nips and even a tobacco, like this guy here, like a tobacco hatchet, like whack it back. Oh, wow. Yeah, so whack it back and squirt it. But I had to do that like, I don't know, early in the, early in the sun, June probably before I could even use the damn tree. Well, I worked my ass off to do that, and there's a fence break right in behind me, and on that's just another added bonus. I just lowered one of those woven wire fences down with some zip ties and made a nice little avenue to hop out onto the high spot if they they wanted to. Along the short of it, I hung that set there and finally, and it was a total bastard, but it worked. Um, I put that decoy out, and it was standing corn all the way around me, and where that point sticks out. Is all waterway pivots, and I shot um, a buck I call Summer Sam over it. And it, that was a lot of work. It wasn't a big habitat change, but it was managing plants. Oh my gosh, the, it was, that was a, a lot. Of, it was a lot of work. It was the hardest I've ever worked trying to get one uh, stand in a tree. I can't believe it paid off, but it, it just shows you it doesn't take brains it just takes work with this stuff man it's like what you guys do like it's work it's work yeah no kidding i think um you know a couple things it sounds like there and that you did right you know being the right tree with the cover and and then the, the fence line exactly you know it could have been a ditch or something that's keeping keeping these deer from going behind you or that high point you used that's see that that's what i'm glad i asked because that's something to think about in an area with more topography deer definitely like that you yeah. know my my land's flat as as a table so why it's kind of interesting works, to why this works so well that thumb 
as it sticks out right in behind as it joins the timber, it's just totally impassable ravine behind it. So you can use that structure like a pit and exactly. they, have, they have to work around you in that field and engage that decoy if they can see it. And it's absolutely deadly. And if you use it on any west, you can you can kill one every day of the week there if they don't go behind you like that. Is your wind just blow back off into towards that ravine? Yeah, just into the jump. Yep. yep. That's awesome. Yeah, I was just down in Mississippi on a client property and the guy has this big impassable ravine on his would be due west side, but they they don't get the west winds like we do, which was surprising to hear. They're more of an east. A north or a south so i'm like well that's perfect then um just like you're saying have the the wind blowing off blow your sun off into that ditch um so yeah good good mouse trap what, what was that buck you killed what did you call him son, son of sam. son of sam yeah i think i saw it. you you make a video on that one yeah yeah i saw that video yeah i live i won one liberty so i'm not a marksman but <laughs> and they're doing that buddy well man when you're self you know how it is when you guys do a cell film thing yep it's tough when you've got a, a non-typical you've been chasing your ass off for two years standing in front of you like licking his chops at this decoy and he literally just comes out of the corn i'm like oh there he is oh my god i'm panicking <laughs> it, like instant panic and it's hard to get the camera on and get everything lined up and he's circling this decoy two or three times. It just it was a most nerve-wracking hunt. But um, we we you know, live one month Liberty and we left him all day. And um, a friend of mine has a really really good dog. He's a good houndsman. And we can't we went right in and found him. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I got no problem letting him lay. I uh I've hit that liver too many times, so I hear you. Oh, yeah, it's so critical. Um, people don't realize, you know, when you go back to this vet thing and where it ties in, like with the liver hit, let's talk about that real quick. So, like the liver has got a couple of big vessels that feed it, you know, big ones. One's branching right off the aorta. And the vena cava is taking the blood away from the liver, all the blood away from the liver. But if, the, if you hit the liver dead square, it's just like this giant capillary bed full of tiny, littler, smaller vessels, right? So a liver hit deer, unless you're hitting one of those great, what we call the quote, great vessels, one's feeding it. If you don't hit one of those that are under pressure, he's going to seep. It will bleed and it'll keep bleeding and bleeding and giving that hemo abdomen. Um, but it's going to be slow. So everybody says, I give liver hit deer 12 hours. I err on the side of caution on them, uh, or excuse me, six hours. Um, I err on the side of caution and give them as much as a gut shot deer uh, every time. Liver can bleed fast, it can bleed slow. It just depends on what vessels are hit. Yeah, they're not going anywhere. I, I try to yeah. get, stay patient and, and give them a little extra time just because of what you just said. I mean, it's if they're dead in six hours, they're going to be laying there at 12. And yeah. unless you've got a major coyote problem or some other thing that you're really worried about, I don't see any reason to go the shorter distance. Yeah. And I yeah. hate tracking at night too. Like despise it. I'm red green deficient and I can't, well, I can't, I really, I can't see blood to save my bacon. I'm terrible. Um, so I like, I'd rather track in the day, any day, like for sure. Just, yeah, any day. Yeah. Well, shoot i i don't have a problem seeing colors and i hate tracking at night so i'm yeah i can't imagine you know it's like you can't even see 30 40 yards ahead of you something you would walk up upon the next day and be oh duh you know it's like i don't know, I, I, i've learned over the years not to push at all i'll let it lay all night it it's the best thing to do it works it works where you guys are at do you guys have any dog services available to you yeah, I've used one um, one time, and then I used one with my brother one time, and it was simply amazing. And I will always have one on standby, no matter yeah. what. Brian, how about you? I've never personally used one, but I've 
been a uh, present for a friend that used one in PA. They're legal in PA in Ohio. So I've, I've been around some of them, but never had to use one. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you my story real quick. I liver shot deer. Um, imagine that. Uh, it was my first year I shot on my 15 acres, 10 point, And he was coming in, self film, got him to stop, shot, mule kicked, ran around me, wasn't falling over. Um, about the same place I shot one of them this year, actually. And I just watched him slowly walk out, flicking his tail, walk out in, I, into this big 400 acre swamp. And I knew it was liver hip. I could see some blood and he's not falling over. So I started doing the math and you figure it out. Well, then the, then it starts to rain like it always does. Right. So you get the dog guy on the phone. He can't show up till I think it was about nine 30 PM. And I shot it at probably six. Um, he showed up right as it started to downpour and that dog, we had blood, decent blood for a little while. And then we ran out that he, that dog took that deer scent in standing water, like, 550 yards and we found him still alive <laughs> so it's like un unbelievable um in standing water and the dog was one of those i think it was a wiener dog probably a better term for it that i'm just lacking but um dachshund or or something but in standing water that dog through a swamp it's impressive it was Amazing. insane i was just my, my mind was blown um un unbelievable it's cool. I've, I've been on some dog tracks and, and that this appeals to the vet side in me a little bit too. When you come, when you, my, the, the fellow I use, he's helped me out a couple times and, uh, you know, a couple, one, he, just, when you're not sure, he's a good guy to have on your side. Sure. Um, but he'll call me and say, Hey, what do you think about this hit situation and spitball anatomy ideas about it? And, uh, when that dog gets to working, you can see it click and then it's going and the dog will stop and check but and a lot of a lot of how a dog works in the woods is based off of, off of exactly how the deer smell us uh, you know it's it's volatilized scent that's in the air and man those dogs can they'll cut the wind with their nose if you watch them on a windier night and they'll just skip the goddamn blood trail. They'll go, you know, they're hooking into that wind cone and then they'll pick up that trail. Like, it's amazing to me uh, just to sit back and watch a dog that knows how to work. And when you see that motor turn on, like, whoop, whoop, there it is. You're, you're off to the races then, man. You know it's on. No kidding. Now, can you train a, can you train a lab to do that as well? I know they're not hounds. Um, but I just, I didn't know. I, I certainly think you can train any canine um, okay. to, 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 uh, to, to scent trail or blood trail deer. Um, a friend of mine uses wire hair dachshunds, you know, little big guys. Um, of course, my, uh, the other one I was just telling you about to help me find Sam, uh, and he's a bloodhound man. And if you want, if you want pure olfactory power, there's yeah. nothing better than a bloodhound. Um, I do know a fellow and I treat his dogs for, um, he is a search and rescue guy. Um, and he takes his dogs over for, um, you know, deceased or missing persons or whatever, all over the country. Um, and, uh, you know, he uses, um, a Doberman of all things. So, um, you know, wow. they, they do it. Yeah. And, um, you know, they're, you can train a dog to scent, I think scent trail anything. It's the handler that starts it you know they, it, yeah. they've got to find the click but the handler delivers it sure okay good stuff well clint i got one more for you uh we always wrap up with asking our guests what your favorite tree is oh my you're gonna think yeah. persimmon tree right well you kind of led us with that yeah. so I'm, I'm, no, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna swerve you uh <laughs> And it's probably not very many people's favorite tree, I wouldn't guess. I like a beech tree. Um, around here, I've got a special kind of connection with this beech tree I got behind my house here. One of my relatives got their name carved in it from like 1938. 
That's cool. And she's my aunt, my dad's sister, but my grandmother passed away before I was even born, so she's kind of like stand in. Well, her name's carved in that old beach back there. And I like those beech trees too on a strategic side of things now. They hold their leaves nice and late in the hardwood timber. And up top in the hardwood, it's bare come leaf drop. And I can't tell you how many times I've sat either near or in a beach with those leaves and had stuff all around me and they don't even know it. It's great white tail cover. And another thing too, I like those beech trees, how they, they'll have those little offshoots there right just above the ground, right at scrape pipe level. Oh, yeah. Boy, you, you know, they find all kinds of good interior scrapes on those. Um, just a phenomenal tree. And I like too the you know, people that carve their names in them, I think they call them like arbor lifts or something like that, where people carved their names in them years ago, whatever. I just like seeing them and going, it's pretty cool. Somebody from 1948 was here and here I am, you know, so yeah, beach, that's, that's why my beach tree's on the list. I like it. I like <laughs> it. We, I, yeah, we, uh, we have a bunch of those in, in Duncan's Woods, which is this wood park where I'm in the town where I'm from and there's names in there from I couldn't even tell you when my, I think my dad's name is one of those from when he was a kid. Uh, and to your point, I was just up at our Northern Michigan property this past weekend and it's partner April and there's still leaves on some of those little beech trees up there. Um, wow. All winter long, you know? So yeah, I understand that. Uh, it, okay. We've been asking this kind of a, a part two part of the question. If you had one implement you could choose for habitat work moving forward for the rest of your life, only get one, what would it be? Well, if I only had one for the rest of my life and I couldn't have any other ones. Now, are we talking yeah. big implements, small implements, or hand tools? I, you know, I think the question was kind of like best implement in your opinion. And I think I just threw on the whole rest of your life thing to make it more dramatic. So whatever you want. <laughs> If we're calling a saw an implement, it's 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 definitely either if we're talking hand tools as implements. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. A saw would qualify. Yeah, a saw would yeah. qualify. This guy right here. Oh. Like I'm not kidding you. Like because I'm just beating the shit out of this, um, you know, invasive stuff. I found this tobacco hatchet at like an antique shop in Kentucky where they grow tobacco, right? Yep. And I'm like, I'm going to try this thing just to see what it'll do. And it'll thump the tar out of those little bitty, um, uh, 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 invasives that we were just talking about, autumn olive and bush honeysuckle, it'll slice right through them, just like quick, quick as a hiccup. You don't even have to make more than one stroke. And a lot of times uh, you pack that in a good set of nips, um like um like those little ratchety like oh i don't know i got some over here those like fisker's brand ratchet uh loppers yeah they're, you know they're yeah. about yay long you combine those two i couldn't live i could not live without those where i live to create good deer structure and one of the things like to that note like when Sometimes I'll, with that bush honeysuckle, I'll just take the opposite approach. Sometimes I'll clear out an area that I either A, need to shoot, or B, like I want to funnel them by. And I do a lot of that with just hand tools. Ah, very interesting strategy right there. Save that little one for the end. I like it. It's like a two for one deal. Like, hey, I'm <laughs> getting rid of these garbage trees. Oh, and I want to shoot a boomer right here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, follow them through. I like it. Well, Clint, hey, I appreciate you coming on, man. Appreciate your time. Uh, it's always sure. been good chatting with you. And and let's hear, you know, where the listeners can can read some of your articles, maybe, or, or find out more more about you. We haven't covered the magazine yet either. Oh yeah, so I've been writing for North American Whitetail lately. We just we just put out a uh, kind of a coffee table style. Uh, this this magazine's kind of thick card stock. It's their um, land management guide, habitat stuff, and they've got a lot of good articles in it. Um, Dr. Kroll, um, he's got a, several in it. Uh, they let me write a couple. Um, I, I got a couple about 
um, how ruminant nutrition fits into some of your habitat management decisions. Um, and um, also about the one article I wrote, I really enjoyed writing was about how like, before you take a saw or do anything to a piece of timber, I think it's best to understand how wind flows through your area. You were just talking about it, Jared, like uh, down in Mississippi, they get east here. Like, I think before you do anything at all, the piece of habitat, you need to understand how that wind flows through that property to the letter as best you can. And I went through some of my methods on um, how I like to do this for hunting purposes, but if I had a big spread of land and before I'd cut the single tree down, I'd be learning all those wind directions in there and how it flows with the terrain. Um, but yeah, so other than that, I have a, I just kind of have a do-it-yourself YouTube channel. It's under Deer Hunter DVM and I'm on Facebook under my name. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, well, I'll be sure to get myself a copy of that North American Whitetail Habitat uh, magazine there. Catch up on your articles and yeah, Deer Hunter DVM on YouTube. Awesome, man. Well, thanks so guys, much. Well, you guys keep doing your thing too, because like as a do-it-yourself guy, no kidding to plug you guys for a minute. Like it's really important that like we're all students of the game now. And like a lot of the stuff I see you guys doing, it's stuff that you know, it's stuff that anyone can do. You don't have to have a thousand acres in Iowa and um like giant tractor implements to make a little headway for the critters, you know what I mean? So you guys keep doing your thing. I really dig it. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Definitely. All right, Clint. Appreciate it, brother. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks again. All right. Thanks, guys. Clint.